everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Healing Home. Happy Halloween, happy Samhain, happy All Eve of All Saints Day, whatever you celebrate or don't celebrate, this is going to be a banger. And I specifically reached out to this lovely lady who's going to be on with me tonight to do in a Halloween episode because we're talking about the Process Church of the Final Judgment. And for those of you who've been following my channel or who know me personally, you know that I really have a fondness for the Manson mythos, for the 1960s, for the hippie movement, for all the fuckery that was going on during that time. And the Process Church of the Final Judgment is up in the mix in a big way. And so my guest tonight, her name is Dana, uh, Dana of Rotting Jewels. That's her handle on YouTube. Uh, she has been doing some amazing research on the Process Church, and she's been uncovering so many gems that I am just like, holy moly, there is so much to go into. There's so much to talk about. And she is helping me to uh, further understand a lot of the research I've been doing over the, you know, the almost decade on this topic specifically, because she's been going into court records and uh, newspaper articles and all sorts of stuff. So if you haven't already found Dana, check her out on YouTube. Uh, that's where she goes live quite a bit. You can find her, all of her information in the description. But without further ado, would you all help me in welcoming Dana to the stream? Everybody, hello. Hey, Dana, welcome to the Healing Home. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. I'm great. How are you? I'm doing good. Uh, this is one of my favorite holidays, or I'll say times of the year. Always has been, always will be. Um, and I think that our episode tonight is very appropriate for this time of year because uh, there's a lot that wants to be said. There's a lot that wants to be heard. And there's so many things that I'm looking forward to diving into with you tonight. I could not agree more. This is definitely uh, the spookiest of topics, in my opinion. <laughs> Dude, I'd have to totally agree because as you say in your streams, we're literally fighting demons here. Uh, and you're totally right. And as soon as I saw you open with that line, I'm like, dude, this woman is the shit. <laughs> so for <laughs> if you could please introduce yourself for anyone who's maybe not familiar with your work, um, where they can find you and anything else you'd like them to know before we get started. Sure. Um, I am on Twitter at Dana Duda. I am Rotting Jewels on YouTube and Instagram. Um, and how we got to the process was I had started a series about the Babylon working and the idea of the homunculus moon child. So I had a deep suspicion that L. Ron Hubbard is Michael Aquino's father, uh, that it was not Marjorie Cameron and Jack Parsons. I thought that maybe, you know, Marjorie Cameron was like a honeypot and he was targeted by Hubbard and uh, Marjorie Cameron. But I knew that in going through that timeline from you know, the 40s all the way through that I was going to have to get to the process. And I did not realize that they had not been fact checked. Like nobody ever really asked them questions when they were, you know, running through their different phases. And I just didn't want to do it a disservice. And here we are uh, realizing, uncovering all of the intelligence ties and that they are deeply protected deeply protected, not only by uh, our government, but the British government at a bare minimum as well. Yeah, it's like, um, yeah, the protection is real because they're a valuable asset uh, because of all the things that they're into, because of what, I mean, people, most people who are here probably um, have known for a long time that, you know, our governments, our uh, authorities or, what ha or whatever you want to call them are into some dark stuff. And a lot of it is usually satanic. A lot of it is linked to um, you know, just the, the darker corners of the world and the earth and this realm. And so the process, when they come across people that aren't afraid to dive into this stuff, but they'll take it to the next level and they'll work with them and they're going to like be organized and uh, have programs that they run and everything else. Yeah, they're going to protect their asset really well. And they've done that like in, in spades with the process, because 
even anyone who's like started to look into it, they're like usually just mentioned very briefly in books or whatever. And it's just like, oh, the process of the, you know, process, uh, Church of Final Judgment, whatever. They briefly talk about Scientology. They'll briefly talk about the history. But, uh, you know, as we were talking about earlier before, it's like you've been able to uncover so many other things with them that connects them to all these you know, nefarious things that we're talking about today. So I guess what I wanted to um, find out from you too is like when you first started your series and everything, um, was there a certain piece of information that tipped you off? Like, okay, I have to go deeper into this. And if there was a certain piece of information, what was that that made you like really want to go into this a little bit deeper? So Ed Sanders had to remove the chapter from the family about the process here in the United States. So that went to court. They ended up settling out of court and that was done. It was a wrap. And he wasn't blaming just the process. He was blaming three cults. Now, in my opinion, I think that it was other factions of the process itself. However, uh, I knew that there was a lawsuit in the UK that they lost. And it's like 400 pages long and some of the pages are missing. But the main thing that tipped me off into wanting to go through all of those court records was the Scientology whistleblowers that I've been working with, the McLaurys. They showed L. Ron Hubbard's intelligence ties to when he was in Tangier. So he was in Tangier specifically with Miles Copeland, John Star Cook, uh, William S. Burroughs, and in Love, Sex, Fear, and Death, Timothy Wiley talks about being in Tangier with William S. Burroughs and I think uh, Byron Geisen and I think maybe John Star Cook. And I was like, okay, that's not a, that's not a coincidence. A, Tangier is extremely obscure, especially at that time. You know what I mean? Um, and it's all of these people who end up somehow being tied to Scientology and intelligence. So that was when I said, okay, I have to fact check them. But those court records, it, it gives you so, so much. And I mean, I think that they did Ed Sanders really dirty here in the States. I really do. Yeah, I would have to agree. And, you know, I, when the Ed Sanders stuff came out, you know, and I, I had read the family and this was years ago. And then I learned about the process and I started doing straight research on the process. You know, uh, my, uh, fiance had bought me the book, um, where they compiled all the magazines. Uh, and that's, that is seriously, that's a gold mine in and of itself, yeah. because I know you've pointed out too, they interviewed Jimmy, Jimmy Savile. And we knew at that point who Jimmy Savile was. And we're like, okay, this, this group is way darker than we expected them to be. So that was our kind of tip off. And then when, when I heard about the Ed Sanders smearing, um, I kind of then was like, okay, well, maybe the process wasn't as big of a deal. Right. And so I started, I kind of like, mm, I guess you could say I bought into that narrative for a second. Cause I'm like, okay, yeah, maybe that is, you know, a fantasy thing or he's trying to make it more satanic panic or whatever. So then for a couple more years, I was like continuing my research and I'm like, man, but there's no way that Manson was not connected with these people if they're into what they're into. Um, and so now like coming full circle and hearing you speak about this, I'm just like, yes, that is exactly what happened to Ed Sanders. And it's a shame because that book is actually really, really well written and it's really good. And so as usual, they're just trying to throw people off the trail and it it did work it worked on me a little bit it really did because i was like yeah that could be maybe maybe it's not you know and so um anyway i would just encourage people who maybe were thrown off by the trail of the trail on that one to kind of reconsider uh what this is all about and and what ed really had to say and that it was probably a hundred percent true and accurate I could not agree more uh, in those court records. It's it's so fascinating because they they admit to meeting Manson before he went to jail. They admit it and that maybe, maybe there was an influence. And then there's confirmation that they had other, uh, you know, 
they call them splinter groups. I'm not going to call them that. It's the process. It doesn't matter because they're still teaching and preaching the exact same thing, the end of the world, the destruction of humanity, and we have to save animals. But, you know, they had a chapter in, I think, Santa Barbara and San Jose. And specifically, you know, they try to distance themselves from Brother Eli, which is Victor Wilde. He was in the motorcycle gang, the, uh, I think it's the gypsy jokers. And, um, but when you really look into those court records, you see that, yes, he was a part of it. You know how they try to paint themselves as they were not involved with any motorcycle gangs, anything like that. No, they were, they absolutely were. And he is the exact same person who was, uh, you know, making the leather cutouts for Manson. Cause everybody knows that Manson loved to wear those. He's the exact same person. Um, but I don't think it's anybody's fault for being thrown off of the track. You know, I had heard of the process a few years back and I was just like, then you look them up. It's really hard to find anything that gives a deep history of them. And those court records were the only reason that I was able to confirm what some of these people's birth names were. And then that's where I'm like, okay, so this is their church name then. Cause like they had a phase of two years where they had two or three names. So that's super fun. And they're not trying to throw anybody off of the scent. <laughs> they make it complicated for a reason. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, no entirely. And you know, I know uh, one of the things that just threw me off or was like, whoa, was when I learned about their connection with the uh, Best Friends Animal Sanctuary, which obviously you've been talking about. And I remember bringing that up to a, a close group of our friends and being like, yo, you have to like look into this because why do they want to have animal sanctuaries? Why are they controlling animals? Okay, my mind always goes to to a lot of things. You know, there's the bestiality side you could take. There's the animal like experimentation, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, the sale of animals, the breeding of animals, the amount of money that's in that industry in and of itself is kind of shocking and also just creepy to think that they want to be involved in this. Um, and that was a kind of a bigger eye opener for me too. to think that, too, that is also hidden in plain sight because they kind of like allude to it in their website. Oh, started by a riffraff a group of friends back in the day and, you know, whatever. So uh, if you wanted to go into that a little bit and some of the things that you found out about the Best Friends Animal Sanctuary in your research for people that may have never heard of this connection with the Process Church and Scientology. We also have to remember that this is like all breeded from Scientology and it's still a living, growing, breathing thing. Yes, it absolutely is. Um, so I used to say allegedly that this is the process. It's I'm not saying that anymore. I have factually proven that Best Friends Animal Society is the process church of the final judgment. These people have not changed. Um, so why is a weird, you know, sort of uh, satanic, maybe not satanic cult running an animal sanctuary in Utah? It's understanding their ever-changing theology to how they got there. And once you do, it makes sense. The watered-down version is Mary Ann de Grimston, one of the co-founders. She specifically was very anti-vivisection, pro-animal rights, and in their early publications, they had a lot of the really graphic anti-vivisectionist literature with a lot of photos of horrific stuff being done to animals, and she would state repeatedly that harming animals is the ultimate sin. It is the greatest sin. Now, the other part of their theology, which came from her husband, or her first husband, Robert de Grimston, was, you know, the destruction of humanity. That way, you know, Satan, Jesus, Lucifer, Jehovah, everything can be reunited as one. But in order for that to happen, humans have to be destroyed. So, in getting to Utah, the way that one of the former members who now works for the National Science Foundation for the U.S. government studying cybernetics, William Sims Bainbridge, the ultimate sus lord, uh, he wrote this fantastic scholarly paper, and it talks about the transmutation of process 
and he lays out that theology, but he says animal advocacy is the natural conclusion or the natural progression. It is not a radical conversion. So that is what they're doing. And that's why it's so important, in my opinion, for people to understand their backgrounds. And I think that's why like photos help in the old newspaper clippings. I try to show people these are the same people that were involved in all of this other stuff, but this is naturally where they're going to go because this is what they've been preaching since day one. That's, that's, it's where it was going to end up. It's unfortunate that they've had such a stranglehold on Utah, uh, specifically within Kanab and Kane County. Um, you know, I mean, I've had people tell me that they basically own the water supply in Kanab, which is really crazy. And the property that they own is where people have been hunting for Montezuma's gold, which is also really strange. Um, and obviously, I would point out to people which were not there in the timeline yet, but for those that are familiar with the uh, satanic ritual abuse case that was in the late 80s uh, that Mr. David Leavitt was recently implicated in, and that has been going on for a couple of years, the investigation. Uh, I have tied his brother, who was the governor of Utah, Mike Leavitt, right now to the best friends in their early stages. That's around the time that the process came to Utah. So I don't think that the timeline uh, is something to look away from. I do think that it's relevant. Yeah. Oh, man, totally. And I can't I have to think about Mormonism as well and it being also probably connected in a deep way, um, you know, and I I mean, they the best friends animal sanctuary or society Dude, I mean, they make their multi million dollar company. They're a nonprofit, nonprofit, but you know, it's like, whoa, come on. I mean, I was, you, you can just look at their, on their Wikipedia page, even on Wikipedia, it's pretty open about them being connected to uh, the process and uh, that, you know, the very surface level kind of stuff is on the Wikipedia. Um, I wanted to ask you if, have you ever heard of the um, cat litter brand Integrity? No, I haven't. Did okay. they make it? I think so. And I feel like, okay, so years ago when I was like, when I first found out about the best friends connection, I started researching it and we were actually buying that litter for our cat because they make like the cracked pine and all the natural stuff. And I was like, oh, this is great litter, whatever. And then I like learned, I'm pretty sure that they own that company. And I was even doing some research on it again today and I couldn't find the connection, but in my mind and my heart, I remember finding that and being like, no shit, they own that, that litter and it's called integrity. And so it's just like, again, you know, let's use the, the nice words. Yeah. We have integrity and everything else. Um, and so they, uh, the, uh, integrity brand is under a brand called neighborhood pet products. And so they have four other companies that are there, whether it's food or it was litter. And then there's like, um, you know, cleaning, so you know, like soaps and things like that um, and brushes and stuff. So they're worth looking into. They don't have much information like linking them to best friends. I feel like they they are located in Texas, but I think the integrity brand could be linked to the process as well. And that's just something I learned years ago. So I was wondering if you had ever heard of that at all. I will dig into the corporate records because now I'm very <laughs> curious because I've found some very uh, weird products that they had patented and trademarked and they didn't seem to fare too well. So I haven't, you know, like shown them yet, but there is a couple. So that would make sense to me because they have to have other income coming in. And, you know, like you said, they have so much money. And one of the charity watchdogs, uh, it's this article and the cover of it is so appropriate because it's like the Grim Reaper. And it says, why does Best Friends Animal Society have two private planes? And it's like, well, that is a very valid question. The excuse that they give is that, you know, they're transporting animals. Why are you guys transporting animals from other states? Uh, I found a fascinating video day before yesterday 
best friends was in Haiti in 2010, the same time as the Clintons. So I will obviously be digging into that because I think that that is extremely suspicious. Um, but as far as airplane traffic, you know, I've traced some very strange doctors who were tied in with best friends back in the early 90s who were involved in experimental medicine who also... Mm starting an airplane company in Utah. So I think that there's a lot of really dangerous, suspicious stuff going on out there. Um, it's just a matter of trying to tie it all together. But I, I'm going to look into that because I want to find every single avenue of income that they have, because that's the only way that we're going to figure out what they're doing. Yeah, it's true. Because I mean, as you know, and many people know, it's like you follow the money <laughs> and you are you find the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, so to say. Um, and I just think that you mentioned this in your last stream, but just kind of like the um, the thought that money creates happiness and stuff and how it doesn't. <laughs> and then that, you know, that that feeling only gets you so far and then there becomes this a want for control and power. And I just think that these organizations and these people are really out of, they, they're so out of control in their own life. They are so damaged and they're probably uh, traumatized themselves. And who knows what happened to them at some point to allow them to carry out the things that they do now, you know, and I really do truly believe that a lot of these people that could be a higher up in these organizations or whatever are either like MK ultra victims or they're open vessels or they're straight up demons or whatever demons have inhabited them, uh, their experiments themselves. Um, which kind of brings me to, uh, Manson and that connection and his connection to Scientology um, and some of the stories that you hear about him, his trainings that he got in jail, whether that's real or not, um, them finding an e-meter at the Spawn Ranch. Um, and I kind of think that he definitely was a patsy or he was a fall guy. But I also wonder like how much of him was an MK Ultra, a product of MK Ultra, and uh, was he being handled by some people in the process, like were the process handle actual handlers for some of these people like Manson or the Manson family or whatever. Um, do you have any thoughts on uh, that, that rabbit hole? Yes, absolutely. I have many thoughts. Um, as far as the, uh, you know, let's start with the DeGrimstons because I feel like there's such a sticking point. You know what I mean? I feel like Mary Ann absolutely you know, there's a good argument to be made that she was very damaged in her youth. I do think that she was a high-end call girl. Um, you know, the stuff with uh, Sugar Ray Robinson, that has not checked out whatsoever. Um, as far as Robert goes, you know, we've seen that Robert was selected through British nobility by, you know, tie of his sister Barbara uh, to, you know, the de Grimston specifically. But, you know, his family was involved in opium trafficking in Shanghai. I've traced his dad as well as his grandfather. His grandfather was working under the Vatican as a clerk of the Holy Orders. So I think that he was kind of bred into this type of stuff. I think that Mary Ann you know, I think that she was a very attractive woman in like the most clear photo that I have found of her. Uh, so was she targeted? Probably if she's a high end call girl and he's living in a high end area, they probably selected her. Um, as far as Manson, you know, the auditing that he was getting in prison, uh, the guys, they named the guy as Lanier Raymer, but his birth name is Lafayette Raymer, which I think is kind of interesting because L. Ron Hubbard's first name is Lafayette. Um, so he did get auditing in prison. He got it in a very short amount of time. He got, I think it was like 100 or 150 hours. Um, my argument that I haven't proven yet, but... Criminon is a program that Scientology has that is, uh, it's almost like its own sort of separate cult, kind of like Narconon, but Criminon is in jails. That's a real easy way to get that information in there without anybody really thinking twice about it. You know what I mean? Um, so if that was being used through a sort of Criminon program, that's one thing, but I don't look at Manson as 
Scientology per se. And here's the reason why, because the Process Church of the Final Judgment, yes, while they have these four deities and they're rotating through them, at the end of the day, when you compare what Hubbard is putting out in his publications and what they're putting out, process is just a dark mirror. And that's all that it is. And when Hubbard puts out the uh, bridge to total freedom, where it's, you know, from chaos to the bridge to total freedom, where you go clear, the process is doing the exact same thing. They're talking about chaos to, they're not calling it total freedom. I can't remember what they call it, but they're basically writing a darker element, but it mirrors it. So I think that they knew because he is, what some people would call, you know, a hippie, a hobo, a bum, whatever you want to call it, because Scientology is for the upper crust. You have to have a lot of money, right? It's it's a status symbol to be a high level Scientologist. Do you know what I mean? But the process, well, you can be just Joe Schmo off the street if you're willing to play ball and follow the rules. And I think that Manson was absolutely uh, susceptible to that. I'm trying to think of the Catholic orphanage that was involved in the Franklin scandal. Um, gosh, I can't remember the name of it, but Manson went, I mean, Manson was in that boy's home, the same one from the Franklin scandal where they were trafficking kids out of that place. So do I think that Manson was targeted because he was experimented on abused as a child yeah absolutely i think he was um as far as the grand scheme of things i mean the church had internal documents they weren't worried about what the process was doing they were worried about the bad pr from manson to me that's you know the church of scientology is protecting the operation but manson's going to be taking the fall that's the way that i see that um I just, I don't, it's Scientology is the umbrella, but everything else falls underneath it. And it's interesting that you point that out about the E-meter being found at Spawn Ranch because the process had the P-scope and it was the exact same thing. So was it a P-scope or was it an E-meter? You know what I mean? It's the exact same thing. They're teaching the exact same thing. I just call uh, the four deities of the process. That's like, it's Scientology with like satanic LARPing basically. Ah, yes. Oh, I love that. That's like a, a really good uh, <laughs> description for it. Oh, my God. Yes, the P meter. I know when I learned that I'm like, dude, I mean, I don't know. It's just um, it's not even uh, unique. <laughs> <laughs> like they weren't even trying too hard to like change it over E meter, P meter, whatever. Um, yeah. You know, I like your take on the Manson thing because um, I have you ever read the book reflection by uh, Lynette from squeaky from no um, I recommend it. And she has a section in the book where she talks about how, you know, obviously Manson was on parole pretty much the whole time he was romping around. He was, uh, you know, breaking the law continuously and he was able to get away with it, you know. And so she tells a story how at one point uh, it was her, Mary and Manson. They were the three that were like the OGs, like they were just traveling around and doing their thing. This is before Spawn Ranch, before they had done any of that stuff. Um, he Manson was contacted by a sociologist that he had in um, McNeely Island Prison. And the parole officer said, oh, yeah, this will be good for man for Charlie. You guys should go up to Washington State and, and meet this sociologist. OK, so she tells the story how they drive there. And it's very, you know, it's it's a cool book because there's an innocence to it because she's literally just like recalling these stories that they're having. But so they get to the home of the sociologist and some kind of thing about money comes up and. You know, I'm not 100% sure on all the details, but what's really interesting about this interaction is how Squeaky Fromm notices. She says, when we left that man's house, I saw the Manson that everyone started talking about after the murders. There was something that happened to him there, whether he was triggered by this guy, whether the guy had special language that he knew was kind of like going to flip a switch in Manson. 
but she talks about how he basically like the kind sort of like nice uh humble person that she knew before that she had been traveling with it wasn't there anymore. There was something that happened there and he was ready to like abandon them on the roadside. He put the pink slip from the van they were driving on the front seat with the keys and he went up into the mountains where that they were parked near. And she just talks about how we just followed him because we didn't know what else to do. And that at some point in that, on that mountain, he like snapped out of it a little bit and they went back to the van and they continued traveling. But there was something there that I'm just like, I want to learn more about it. And I wondered if you had heard anything about, you know, interactions he's had with people from prison. Um, but it's a very candid uh, example because she maybe didn't understand or didn't even know to this day that that could have literally been something could have happened with that sociologist that day that like turned on him or, or turned something on in him. That's why I always wonder about just like his programming and what happened and stuff like that. And anyone who knows about MK ultra, but trauma specifically, you know, how, um, you know, when you're reminded of something, it's like, Oh, okay. You know, you, something happens, you go into a different mode or you, you, you go back into that trauma. Um, so anyway, something I wanted to bring up to you because it's very interesting to me to think about what happened there, or what the deal was. Yeah, absolutely. I think that there is a massive missing element. And I think that Tom O'Neill is doing a great job and has done a great job of trying to tie in academia specifically into this, because I think that academia is a huge problem here. Um, I think specifically the Esalon Institute, Stanford Research Institute, the Mid Peninsula Free College, um, there were so many weird universities. I mean, even stuff going on at Berkeley. And, you know, we know that Manson was at a salon. You know, what he says happened there. Well, is that what happened or is it not? But, you know, Stanford Research Institute is, you know, doing research about uh, like remote viewing and like telepathy and all of that stuff. And then Esalon is doing all kinds of weird stuff, including all the parapsychology, all of that. And isn't it strange that the process says that they can communicate telepathically and the family is saying the exact same thing and they're all in this area at the same time. So one thing that I'm really trying to hone in on, you know, on my own, but I don't want to bring it up until I have a good argument for it is was I know that specifically Father Christopher... Christopher DePire, Christopher DePire, he was at Berkeley. He gave a speech at Berkeley. I have to find it. I've read somewhere that Robert de Grimston gave a speech at Esalon. Haven't found any proof of that. But these people were embedded into these facilities and these facilities, well, uh, you know, we know that they had drugs, right? Because what was the rumor as far as what happened at Cielo with Wojciech Frykowski? Some were saying that, uh, you know, even Roman Polanski was, you know, dabbling in drugs. Was it bad mescaline? Was it bad MDA? You know, because there's an argument that maybe it was a drug deal gone wrong. I don't necessarily buy that, but we have to keep in mind in the grand scheme of things, you know, the Brotherhood of Eternal Love, Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters, they're running around trafficking these drugs. We also have you and Cameron in Canada specifically doing experiments with mescaline and MDA. Was it a bad batch from Canada? Because uh, they were literally trafficking those drugs, the Brotherhood of Eternal Love. They were moving drugs from Canada down to California, too. And it's also interesting to note um, in the Senate hearing for the Brotherhood of Eternal Love, Dr. Leary ends up getting arrested, but he was heading to the same place that the process was in Mexico in the New Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, he got picked up for some weed, but he was heading there at the exact same time. And per the Church of Scientology, their records show that the process was uh, doing paramilitary training when they were in stool. So were they beating themselves in huts? and finding Satan or Satan finding them, or were they doing paramilitary training? You know, I think it's a combination of both. 
have to agree with you. And I love these connections that you end up making with, you know, the Ken Kesey's and the Tim Leary's of the world, because my hunch, um, especially over the last handful of years, has been that they were like, super, super integral uh, with the drug distribution and trafficking. And isn't it funny that these groups, particularly the Merry Pranksters, have big buses and they just do nationwide bus tours and they go out and they do their kooky uh, street art, whatever. It's not even art, in my opinion. You watch some of this old footage and it's like almost uh, hard to watch to think like, the stuff that they're doing is so annoying and so kind of like um, uh, absurd to me that that in and of itself seems like some sort of program, you know, because anyone who also has looked into the hippie movement from a skeptical place, see, you can see how a lot of these things uh, were infiltrated or were planned or were just like pushed onto these communities and the people ate it up. You know, because it was such a uh, volatile time. It was a time of exploration. There were a lot of young people who had run away from home, who didn't have relationships with their families. So they're open vessels in a little bit of a way. They're, they're, they're looking for community. So these people, like the process and these other people were talking about, it's like it, this was just like uh, like giving uh, candy to a baby or taking candy from a baby a little bit like if that makes sense, it was like they, it was like prime for the pickings, whatever they, they had like everybody, um, by the balls a little bit because they were, um, using drugs. Um, and are you familiar with wavy gravy of the hog farm? I'm sure you are. No. Oh my goodness. Okay. Look into wavy gravy and look okay. into the hog farm. Um, uh, so wavy gravy, uh, he is a clown. Literally he dresses up like a clown. He's still alive. He's pretty old. He runs what's called the hog farm, which is like the longest oldest commune in the United States. Um, I'm pretty sure it's in Laytonville, California at this point. I could be wrong on the city, but, um, basically I'm convinced that he is like, I'm sure he's into children as well, being a clown going around and entertaining children. But I think he was a huge drug trafficking guy. And I think that there's something going on. He was up, you know, in the mix with um, the Merry Pranksters. He also was the hog farm was security at Woodstock, which is another whole rabbit hole that yeah. in my yeah, in my opinion, was like a huge social experiment. Um, we're talking more drugs. We're talking cloud seeding. We're talking having people come and having rain come down, whether that was real or artificial. We're having this, you know, huge music festival. Uh, it's the end of the era. It's 1969. It's like literally two weeks after the Manson uh, murders had taken place. So we have a lot of people who are probably have been splintered a little bit you know and we're and like i said the the era is drawing to a close here and then you have somebody like wavy gravy and the hog farm to do security and we also know that uh they have unique tastes when it comes to security because they are using you know uh hell's angels for altamont and all these other things and there's a big reason for it which kind of brings us back to the drug connection. And I also think that there's a mafia connection to a lot of this and all of this. Oh yeah. Yeah. There has to be right. Absolutely. Because, you know, before I had gotten to the process, I wanted to look into Anton LaVey specifically and Kenneth Anger, because I do think that both Anton LaVey and Kenneth Anger were also part of what happened at Cielo Drive and La Bianca specifically. Um, but Anton LaVey, his father, no, no, it was his uncle. I'm sorry. I think his uncle was in prison with, ooh, I don't want to speak incorrectly, it was a big mafia guy. I covered him one episode, but I mean, so he has underworld ties right there. You know what I mean? Um, and I think that that is a sort of good argument as to why he was allowed to do what he was allowed to do. He also tried to take out a mafia hit on Ted Kennedy. There was a whole like FOIA release of that. If people haven't heard of it, it's pretty fascinating because, uh, you know, that's he tried to use the mob to uh, take him out. And then Kenneth Anger, you know, Kenneth Anger called Bobby Beausoleil his muse. I found this really old interview with Kenneth Anger and it immediately made me think of the possibility that Bobby was involved in the Brotherhood prior to getting with Manson. 
Uh, he said that Bobby came over and had like this massive bale of like really good marijuana and that he got it for super cheap. And I'm like, that's really weird that he's just running around with this huge bale of really nice marijuana <laughs> and they're hanging out like in the height, you know? Um, and then, you know, the stuff that's going on, you know, it's, it's looking at the culture, like you said, with like Woodstock and stuff, like that's sort of like the end of the summer of love. Right. And, you know, technically like the Manson murders were the end, but also looking at, you know, what Kenneth Anger was putting out with the invocation of my demon brother. Um, and that being put out on the autumnal equinox at the straight theater in the height. Uh, I think it was Abigail Folger, like she financed like that she like she donated for that movie to be aired and Manson was there there is an unidentified process member that was there as well uh there were other reported sightings of processians being there because I've shown that the timeline of them actually coming to the states they were here at least two years earlier and that's why it opens everything up to the brotherhood of eternal love to everything else that was going on because i am convinced at this point they were trying to establish the timeline that they came to la late 67 very early 68 and then kind of hit the road right before what happened with Manson so that people wouldn't look at them. Um, but they were in California as early as 1965. I mean, there are multiple police reports out there. Obviously, these police reports have been suppressed. Um, and I think another interesting thing to William Sims Bainbridge, the way that he describes it, and I love it so much, um, because when you think about them coming over here and what what operation are they bringing to the United States as far as the culture? So we have this like Scientology sort of weird group therapy, uh, but it was the implementation specifically of the group aspect, which is very Tavistock and what William Sims Bainbridge calls religious engineering, which everybody calls Tavistock social engineering. But the fact that he terms it that way, I think it's very appropriate because he said that once they did that, the group completely exploded. Like that was when it blew up. Um, and in 1974, they said themselves, they had uh, over half a million members worldwide and they were in over a hundred cities within the United States. I mean, they were everywhere. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it does remind me a lot of biker gangs too, you know, because biker oh, gangs, yeah. Are, yeah, they're the same way. Oh, our headquarters over here in Santa Monica or wherever. And then, oh, but we've got chapters here and here and here and here. It's like, well, why, why would you need that? You know, there's, there has to be some sort of different agenda, you know, behind it as obviously we're speaking about right now, but, you know, I kind of want to get a little bit more into the uh, height Ashbury kind of like hippie movement thing a little bit with you because you and your stream had brought up. And I remember hearing this years ago that uh, some of the girls of the Manson family were coming down with um, where they were contracting uh, canine diseases. And Indeed. For any, oh, Indeed my goodness. Were. <laughs> Ew, it's so dark. And uh, so for yes, people who, who haven't heard that, you know, that's that is a, a a shocker when you hear that. And then there's also such a big connection to the San Francisco Free Clinic, uh, which a lot of people might know of. You know, that was a, 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 what it is, the name of it. It was a free clinic in the San Francisco, uh, you know, where you could go and you could receive quote unquote care if you needed it. I know Manson and his girls were there quite a bit being treated for STDs and all sorts of things. I too also believe that the free clinic was probably distributing, um, you know, other drugs and doing experiments as well. So uh, if you want to go into the canine diseases a little bit and some of the stuff you found, I've, that is such a interesting yet disturbing rabbit hole that I'd love to pick your brain about. So as far as that goes, that was what I found in the uh, in the Ed Sanders files and then in some of the police reports of other people that they had interviewed um, just afterwards kind of asking, you know, what was going on in the height at the time? Because the argument is that, you know, well, the process and Height Ashbury and Charles Manson, 
even though they're literally all within like walking distance of each other. You know what I mean? Even when the process moves their chapter house, you know, because in the court records, they move to three different places. Um, they were doing some weird stuff with horses. They were doing um, God knows what, from what I understand, primarily uh, fellatio with dogs specifically. Um, and I have not seen any of the original full publications of process writings. I have the same book that you have, the hardcover copy that is like the compilation. Um, it's about $700 to get the original copies of those old publications because I would love to see them because I am just wondering if that might be a form of worship for them because they do worship animals uh, as well as sacrifice. They believe that animals have, uh, you know, spiritual powers and can see into the future and are going to, you know, guide us properly. Um, as far as the hike goes, you know, it's, it's Jolly West. Jolly West is such a uh, catalyst for everything, even though the ex-Scientology community tries to deny the late Dr. Lewis Joyland Jolly West ties specifically to Manson. Uh, they seem to be hung up on whether Jolly was controlling Manson as far as, you know, MK Ultra, Manchurian Canada type stuff. But, you know, Jolly West not only was operating through the Height Ashbury Free Medical Clinic, he also had uh, basically, it was just like a setup house where hippies could come and they could hang out, they could stay, they could leave. And he had students there that worked under him. And they were supposed to basically just sit by and kind of take notes and check out the culture, check out the vibe. And he was never really there. Uh, but he was in communication with Sidney Gottlieb straight up. And, you know, there was meth that was coming out into the height as well. So is that why we started to see a ramp up in violence? Because not only did we have that going on directly within the height, and we also have Dr. Leary within the height and Ken Kesey. But in the Senate hearing for the Brotherhood of Eternal Love, they're also trafficking. You know, they are talking about cocaine. They're talking about heroin. You know, uh, when Leary got arrested, he was with his daughter when they were on their way to Mexico. And, you know, she had stimulants on her. You know, obviously it could be a uh, prescription, right? Because they don't specify. They're not like, oh, it's crystal meth. They just said, you know, it's methane, blah, 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 blah. But it doesn't matter. She still had stimulants. So were they also trafficking stimulants at the same time? And were some of these motorcycle gangs doing the footwork for them? And that's why individuals like Manson, because he's not the only one that was getting out of jail all the time. You know, they let him out so many times times. It's stupid. At this point, in my personal opinion, it's stupid for people to think otherwise that he was not being protected and that he was not some sort of asset because normal people don't, That that's not a paperwork error. You know what I'm saying? That's not a filing error or like no. a missed phone call or like somebody didn't show up to work. And so, you know, he just gets let out like 20 times. You know what I'm saying? Especially because the girls didn't get let out. The girls had to sit in jail. They were not protected. Uh, and I think that that also added a sort of a perceived sense of validity of the situation. But he's protected. He has to be let out. Um, but I, I think that you're absolutely right as far as uh, whether people want to call it MK Ultra or not. It is what it is. That's what I would call it. But it's not the cutesy sort of like, oh, like trippy man, you know, people chalk up MK so much to that. Like, oh, we have Timothy Leary, we have Asin Woodstock. And it's like, no, the, these were inhumane things that were being done. And for a lot of people, uh, they did not consent. And a lot of people had no idea. And it ruined a lot of people's lives. And I think that in particular, what happened at Cielo Drive, because I think that Roman Polanski knew what was going to happen. I think that he is completely involved. I think Kenneth Anger is involved um, on the fence about Anton LaVey. Uh, but I think that this was a concerted effort 
to change the culture because of what was going on in Vietnam, because we were trafficking drugs back in the coffins of dead soldiers. Um, and we were running the Phoenix program over there. And when we are looking at the things that are going to come down the line as we move forward, while we know the late Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino was involved in the Phoenix program, uh, you know, and then he starts the Temple of Set. So I do think that that was what Manson was for. I think that he was serving a purpose to sort of collectively shock the nation as a whole, uh, do something so inhu inhumane, grotesque, um, and it's interesting, and I'm kind of glad you brought the height up because I haven't thought about this for a little bit, and I'm going to be doing it at some point. So I have all of Jolly's old publications, like all the stuff that he would write. And right before the Manson murders, he literally puts out a paper talking about how uh, we don't have to worry about hippies. They're not the ones you have to worry about. It's the businessmen in the upper class that are the dangerous people. Whoa. And I'm like, oh, look at Jolly West seeding a narrative into the public psyche uh, because I think that he... Uh, he was trying to get his foot in the door as far as the whole like lone nut or, you know, crazed person sort of narrative, even though I would like to remind people the late Dr. Lewis Joyland Jolly West, Mr. Anti-Cult, never spoke out about the process, never spoke out about Manson, never interviewed Manson, never spoke about the Temple of Set or the Church of Satan. Not once ever in his career. Wow. Wow. That is a, I, I'm look forward to your live stream about that Jolly West uh, stuff. Cause that's really interesting. I had never heard that before. And it was all about putting, making narratives and uh, changing the mindset or whatever. You talk to people who were even alive at that time, you know, when the Cielo Drive murders happen, um, who were, you know, they're like, oh yeah, that's when we started locking our doors. That's when we never locked our doors before that point, you know? And I really do think that there was a very strategic nation worldwide thing with this whole program that was going on, that was playing out that is run so freaking deep. I mean, it's nothing, it's not different than uh, JFK seeing that on the screen that happening 9-11 you know whatever you know whatever your generation's mindfuck is there's one out there and this is this is definitely one that totally changed kind of changed the world overnight really um, and I really think too that there is a huge connection to the new age movement um, which you've kind of really been starting to uncover in your recent streams. Um, so I really want to go into that too, because what I think and what my fiance and I have put together is like, it seems as though Manson was kind of like the hell cell or the satanic panic for the new age, because after this happened, people were just like, Oh my God, but they were, uh, it was a hippie cult. Oh, I don't know what to believe now. And then all of a sudden we have this new age shit where it's like, okay, so you can, um, Oh, love and light and everything's positive positivity, you know, all of this kind of stuff. And we also know that, you know, Scientology kind of played a part in, in ushering this in too. But I think Manson and the process and the stuff you're talking about with them, finding some of these women and their connections with this whole kind of like movement is super important to look at because the new age movement is pretty toxic. Not that there's, it's not all bad. There's like good concepts in there that you can like really apply sure. to your life in positive ways. But as we know, they'll use these things against the actual movement itself. So if you maybe want to talk about that kind of stuff a little bit, and I don't remember the name, I wrote it down. Um, of the um, actual organization that these women were involved with, that they were involved in, um, where they were like doing the laying on of the hands and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's all of them, actually. So it's um, it's even Father Malachi, Father Lucius Nestor, all of them. They were all doing the exact same thing. Like that really famous photo of Father, Ma Father Malachi with like his long hair and the two people are kneeling down in front of him. And that's what he's doing. He's doing the laying of the hands. So they're doing that sort of faith healing. I think that they used the women in particular to... Uh, 
maybe make people a little less uncomfortable because of what happened with Manson, because you have these men with the long hair, they're running around with their, you know, whatever uniform they've switched into at that time. Um, but it was the foundation faith of God. But right before they changed to that, it was, uh, what people know as the great schism within the process where Robert goes his own way and everybody else goes the other way. Well, I think that that's a load of crap because I found one newspaper article where they're interviewing the process and uh, the Jesus people of the process. And they say, well, we're cool with them and we're cool with them. We just don't agree. I think that that is for public consumption, for people to think that they are doing different things. They're not because they're still teaching the same thing. So when you see these women running around as faith healers, uh, so they have a couple different ministries. One was the healing ministry of the conquering king. One was the renewal of the Christian faith. Um, the ministry of miracles, uh, just so many different like Jesus people, uh, Jesus freak factions, the lost soul patrol, the God squad. Um, and I've traced this back to uh, right now. I have them in, I think, February of 1971. So this is them immediately doing this. And I think that it was a strategic PR move specifically um, because they're in New York they're in Toronto, they're in Chicago, they're also in Boston, and they are really heavy in Florida, which I think is interesting when we consider in the future some of the other things that came out of Florida. Um, but this is how they infiltrated and got into the sort of new age, you know, I, I don't even know what you would call it. Like you said, Manson sort of put to death I guess, in the psyche of everyone, the idea of the hippie. And so it's, well, here's hippies, but it's women. And they're, uh, you know, tugging at the traditional orthodoxy sort of faiths, right? Because they're saying that they're a non-denominational Christian church. That's what the foundation faith of God repeatedly said that they were. Um, but they preach that it's a universal God, which, you know, it's, it's one God and the end of the world is coming. The end of the world is coming, you know? And so they're saying the exact same thing. Um, I think it's really fascinating that in the laying of the hands, they're doing exactly what Jim Jones was doing, which was the vomiting up of tumors, that type of faith healing. Um, obviously, they were a bit more successful than uh, Jim Jones, because it's pretty well established now that Jim Jones and the People's Temple, uh, what happened in Guyana was straight up an intelligence operation, and most of those people were murdered. Um, and I think that that is very tragic. But once once we wrap up with the process, we're going to be tying all of that in because this does tie into every other cult, which just is very frustrating. Um, but they move through and do their Jesus freak phase. And that is also where, in my opinion, from the process aspect, because there's a period of time where they are really deep into psychics, numerology, palm reading, tarot, all of that stuff. And that is where I think that Timothy Wiley ends up getting linked up with, I don't know what CIA doctor. I know he ended up hanging out with Dr. John C. Lilly. That is the guy that was taking ketamine and acid and trying to talk to dolphins. Um, and that is what Timothy Wiley was really into later on. Um, you know, he... And that ends up becoming a really big thing after their whole psychic mediumship slash non-denominational Christianity end of the world, you know, phase goes on. Um, and I found this fascinating woman, Estelle Myers, uh, who spent a lot of time with Timothy Wiley. And I mean, she's the one that ended up making underwater birthing a thing because she wanted babies to be able to talk to dolphins as soon as they entered uh, the human realm. Uh, but she was absolutely a member of the Process Church of the Final Judgment. She also worked for Mr. Rupert Murdoch. Uh, so we've got Rupert Murdoch tied in to the process as well. Uh, when they were under the foundation faith of God, and it's very strange because you can find in the corporate records today 
there is still a church in New York that is the foundation faith of God that was the process that never went under the umbrella of Best Friends Animal Society. The two lawyers who are the agent for that, for that church specifically, I did a little deep dive on them. One of those families is specifically Nazi assets that were brought over here during World War II, which is completely insane to me. And the other guy, their family, I have tied them to Italian nobility and also to Operation Gladio in Italy. So, I mean, these people are deep in literally everything. They're in everything. Wow. Dana, <laughs> this is so valuable. This is such valuable information. Um, wow. Yeah. That's a, yeah. All of this stuff is blowing my mind. That's why your recent streams, I've just been like, oh my God, I cannot wait to talk to her because the stuff that you're uncovering, it's again, it's validating so many things that I've thought or I've noticed. And I'm like, huh, how is this lining up? And uh, yeah, I guess just to see how deep the process goes is kind of, um, it's bone chilling, if I'm being completely honest, because it really does, um, I don't know, I, I just, it, it really... Um, it really makes me think about a lot of the uh, just the underworld, the underground networks that we kind of know of and just how much power they have in them. And like they might be the uh, kind of like ones at the top, you know, kind of like how the DeGrimsons would um, refer to themselves as the Omega, you know, like they could be like the Omega of so much of this nasty underground stuff that we're um talking about and i guess to think of it that way um i don't know it's like there's it's nice i guess to know <laughs> but to see like how much they just continue to get away with is um is something to behold i mean really so crazy it's because they play the victim they do the whole uh you know we're we're being fairly misaligned and we're just trying to practice our religious beliefs. And it's like, no, you guys need to be questioned because you guys are in very strange places. You know, if you even just want to step back and look at where they're moving, you know, they're kind of following the brotherhood of eternal love, which is very mm. interesting. So they're kind of following that drug trafficking movement specifically. But when we bring it to current day and we're talking about, you know, like the underbelly of, what's going on today. So the lawyer that represented the process in the UK libel suit that they lost, that was Robert Maxwell's lawyer, specifically, who successfully su successfully litigated for Robert Maxwell. Now, what other tie does Robert Maxwell have to this? Well, Robert Maxwell was involved in Scientology for a time. He was taking Scientology courses. Um, and then something that I'm working on, which obviously, uh, a lot of people are alive and there's a lot of money on the table, so I have to be delicate and have a rock-solid case. But the Church of Spiritual Technology, which is above the Church of Scientology, so in New Mexico, I believe, they have this place in Trementina where they have been what they say is uh, building underground bunkers uh, for hub uh, records of L. Ron Hubbard, you know, for these things to be put away and saved for whatever they think is coming, right? Um, but then you have the stuff going on with best friends. Why do they own so much property? Why is it the land where people have uh, suffered very strange fates looking for Montezuma's gold? Um, and I have, and also in Arizona, they were doing animal husbandry. So I have to dig into the old records there as well, because why are they advocating no kill, but they were involved in breeding for a long time, which makes me think that there's something really sus with, um, sort of like transhumanism type of medicine, you know what I mean? Like the DNA, whatever customized stuff that they're calling it because they change it every single day. But I have a contact out in New Mexico specifically uh, because Christine Maxwell, Gislaine Maxwell's sister, uh, she is involved in the brain Mind Brain Research Institute, which is almost giving me modern day Esalon vibes, which is also very suspicious. But the land records out there around Trementina, where Scientology is doing whatever, 
Well, it's not that far from Zorro Ranch, which is where uh, Mr. Epstein, his ranch was never raided to this day by the FBI, and that was recently purchased. Um, and what I understand is if you were to take the path that, like the trail that the natives would take a long time ago, uh, before it was colonized, whatever people want to call it, modernized, um, you can get to the edge of the best friend's property, to Trementina, and to Zorro Ranch. Like, it's only a couple hours walk, like, between all three. So I think that there's something very wrong and very bizarre going on out there. Um, and something else for people to consider. Uh, so George from Cavdef has been going to the Ed Sanders archives at Princeton and he sent me a couple of police reports, and there are records out there that Best Friends specifically is using, and this was back in the day, this was like 25 years ago, that they were using enough electricity to power a small town, um, and that someone had flown over, and they weren't flying over to see what they were doing, they were just flying, and they were passing over the ranch. Uh, the, the Processians chased them down and threatened to shoot them with a cruise missile. Uh, so I think that there's... Why, why are they running that much electricity? They compared it to an electric industrial company and said that they were using more than that company and that company had a sawmill. Like they had those electronic... Those electric records of the wattage usage that they were using. And they're out in the desert. You think that they're not doing stuff underground? You know what I mean? We have the Church of Scientology doing stuff underground. What the hell was Epstein doing uh, at Zorro Ranch? I think that there's something very, very wrong. Uh, my personal conspiracy theory uh, is this is like Iran-Contra stuff because I don't think that Iran-Contra ever ended. I think that we have at a bare minimum uh, weapons trafficking. I think that we possibly have you know, maybe some something within uh, some type of nuclear or, you know, radiation type of technology. Um, I think drug trafficking is very likely. I think animal and or human experimentation, if people want to take it back to the culty sort of aspect, because if this is still a sex cult and if someone is at the top, well without being graphic, uh, if it's a sex cult, then you could force the women of your herd to terminate uh, at certain stages and be able to use that product for your experimental medicine, your experimental gene therapy. That would be very cheap product. Uh, there is also the thought that because they have horses, rabbits, dogs, monkeys, um, are they using that and selling it and saying that it is for human use, especially, um, you know, like plasma, PRP, the sort of beauty stuff that people are into. Um, and then, you know, if there's any sort of uh, human trafficking, that is obviously one of my suspicions because of the ties to Zorro Ranch. And, you know, there's a court case out there against the Church of Scientology, uh, actually rooted here in Florida. That's where it was filed against David Miscavige and the Church for Human Trafficking as well. So I think that it's a little bit of everything. I think we have a uh, smorgasbord of trafficking going on, among other really evil things. Wow. Yeah. That's like a drop the mic <laughs> moment right there. That the connection of how close the land is together to all three of those places. I mean, come on, you know, like that, it, as we've said already, it doesn't kind of take like much uh, to really look at this stuff and be and have critical thought and kind of think like, it's not a coincidence, you know, it's not a coincidence that this is all linked up and, and together this way. Wow, man, that's nuts. I um, I didn't know about the uh, ranch. Um, Epstein, I didn't even, I had no idea that there was a ranch and he had one and all this stuff, but I'm not surprised. I mean, these people, they are above the law in, in so many ways, but they're not above like natural law, which is always the thing that I go back to in my heart is like, you know, as crazy as this shit is, as painful as it can be to hear it, um, you know, yeah, they're not above natural law. They're not above um, the consequences that come from being in in this uh, 
be, you know, choosing to do what they're doing. And so I guess it's like the only, it's one of the ways to kind of like help swallow it <laughs> a little bit, you know, kind of makes it a little bit easier to know that, uh, cause I'm not necessarily, I believe in karma, but I think that when I think of karma, I think karma happens different than um, it's kind of explained to us in the mainstream. It's almost like karma's instant. You know, it's like you do something that you know is wrong. It's like instantly you're going to have that repercussion. Uh, and it may just not be apparent. Um, it may be an energetic thing or it's something that is going to just like manifest in some other way. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, what's uh, what are some of the things that you've done for yourself just to like, help process some of this stuff on an emotional and physical and spiritual level. Cause I know that it's really heavy and um, you've been very open and candid on your streams. You know, when you come across something that's like, Hey guys, this is really hurting me right now. And I've always appreciated that about you. So if you wanted to share maybe some of your uh, protocols for yourself um, after you go through some of this, I think it could be helpful, helpful for some people out there listening too. Don't let anyone tell you that you're stupid. Don't let anyone make you feel stupid. Uh, don't let people try to shut the conversation down. I think that taking that attitude and uh, not allowing people to silence me has helped me grow just as a person and also as a researcher because I feel, you know, as human beings, but I feel like women, especially like we are born with a very specific sort of intuition. I think that that is one of our natural innate gifts. Um, and it has not led me astray yet. Uh, there are a lot of people that are my subscribers and the whistleblowers that I work with who have also assisted me. So it is not a one man job by any means. Um, but I would say, remembering in the grand scheme of things, honestly, the main thing that keeps me sane is I'm not here to be popular. I don't make money off of this stuff, but look at how hard it is to find the truth, you know, and the truth is so important and it is our right. It is our human right to have access to the truth, to have access to our own history. And I think that as, you know, a collective, as a group, as a community, uh, whatever people want to call it. Um, this is comeuppance for all of the things that have been hidden in the dark, for the victims that have been hidden. Uh, obviously, the stuff with Sharon Tate really like rocked my world with Robert de Grimston. Um, but I mean, that just goes to show how far these people have gone to hide things from us. And I just, I think it's time for this stuff to be brought out, you know, whether people want to call it a reckoning, a comeuppance, you know, I'm not judge, jury, and executioner, but it's time to get the truth out and it's time to show people that we're not scared to talk about the truth. Um, we're not scared to speak about these things because uh, I feel like it's really easy, especially in the realm of Scientology and ex-Scientology because Scientology's lingo and writings are so complicated, it's easy for them to make you feel dumb and shut down the conversation. Don't allow people to do it. No one is the arbiter of truth. No one is the authority on anything, including me. That's why I show you guys everything that I find. You need to see it for yourself. Um, but the truth is out there and we just have to find it. You know what I mean? hundred percent. Yeah, that's well said. And it's really great advice too. Um, because it's, I just think now the time we're in too, just given the technology that they, they give us basically, you know, cause we know the technology that they have is far more advanced, but it's just like, um, it's like, how could this stuff not start coming out? And I just feel like more like conspiracy theory is becoming more mainstream. Even you start seeing like these accounts talking about stuff that I'll look at and be like, oh, man, I remember learning about that like 10 years ago or whatever. But it, it is it's it's like it's reassuring to me or something that there is some kind of shift going on and that the tables are turning a little bit for people like us who who are and have been looking at this stuff for a long time and have like wow okay finally it's kind of like coming to light a little bit um and so i guess it, there is like um some kind of uh, silver lining to it for sure and i always just wonder like what is the next uh you know it's always like what else is around the corner you know to come this far and learn how far this shit goes it's just like oh my goodness you know 
what really is uh, at the top and do I actually really want to know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be for anybody that stuck around, um, you know, we're going to circle a bit on Manson, but uh, then we're getting real deep into the son of Sam. Okay. That's sorry. Hate to break it to everybody. Uh, I tell people if you are coming to hear a narrative or what you have heard in a documentary, whatever true crime podcast, uh, nope, you're not going to get it because I am looking at it from a sort of sh politically sh and like psychologically strategic angle because that is how I think that these things operate. I think that the late David McGowan, uh, the author of Program to Kill, was 110% right. Uh, this is a domestic Phoenix program or a domestic Gladio program. Um, and it is, it is our right to know that they're doing these things to us, you know, because they continue to. And so, yeah, for all the Son of Sam folks, come over because, uh, you know, they're all getting real weird on me, but it's going to get even weirder because I just, it always stuck out to me that he said that a dog told him to do it. And I'm like, that dude was in the process. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, dude, that dog connection. It's uh, pretty wild, actually. Oh, my God. Yes, it yes. Is. I love that uh, we've gotten to talk about this. And I have to ask uh, one thing I wanted to bring up, um, and it does go back to Celio Drive and all that stuff. Have you ever heard the conspiracy that Rosemary's baby was actually like, was actually Roman Polanski's uh, way of showing that he was creating this ritual that was the Celio Drive murders? Yes, and I don't completely disagree with it at all. Uh, like I said, I think that Roman Polanski was a huge element in this. Um, you know, Sharon Tate's dad, uh, I think it's Lieutenant Paul Tate, uh, you know, he was involved in Operation Gladio as well. You know, Sharon Tate grew up in Italy for a time. Uh, so I've had some people that come in with a much more woo-woo that, you know, oh, well, her dad sacrificed her. And I'm like, no, 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 let's not go there because that's, I don't care about that. But the Roman Polanski thing, I think that he was key to so much of this. And that's why I think Kenneth Anger as well, uh, because Kenneth Anger was hanging out with uh, Dr. Kinsey in the Abbey of Thelema. Uh, Polanski's in the Abbey of Thelema. The process was apparently doing, uh, you know, black sex magic magic rituals in the Abbey of Thelema at one point as well around this time. And Robert de Grimston was in Rome with Polanski. Yes, I absolutely think that Roman was uh, trying to flex his muscles because w before Cielo Drive happened, uh, Wojciech Frykowski was doing research and Jay Sebring, I believe, they were helping him work on that movie, The Day of the Dolphin, that ended okay. up getting passed to somebody else, which dolphins, I'm thinking of Timothy Wiley, right, talking to dolphins. But then it's also, you know, is he frustrated with this research? You know what I mean? It's and they're helping him. Why is this not getting done? And his wife is there. Um I, I think that Roman Polanski is uh, one of the biggest pieces of you know what on the planet. Um, and yes, I absolutely think that uh, he is involved in preparing people through media. You know what I mean? As far as what is to come. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I kind of figured you would uh, think that, you know, and I've brought that up to a handful of people with the Rosemary's Baby thing. And I know that Rosemary's Baby was also like based on a book. So there could be some of that. But if you watch Rosemary's Baby with the lens that this could be basically Roman Polanski, kind of like him and Sharon Tate, like they are the characters. I mean, it's it's hard to deny, actually. And the last time we watched that movie, we watched it specifically to do that. And it's just like it, one thing after another. Uh, Dr. Samperstein and their dog was they had the same name as that. And just, you know, starving actor moving to New York to want to be in Hollywood and this and that and whatever. You know, it's just like, oh, my goodness, there is so much crossover here that I, I, I find it hard to believe that it wouldn't have been some kind of uh, spell or ritual or just some something he was putting out into the universe to manifest, you know, who knows, but 
I just wanted to ask you that question because I had a feeling you would think that, but you know, yeah. you never know. <laughs> well, cool. You know, I feel like we packed a lot in, in the time we had together. And so uh, again, I want to give you the floor to allow people to know where they can find you. Uh, as you said, Summer Sam or uh, Son of Sam is coming up. So if you have anything else that you wanted to share or let people know about, the time is yours to do so. And thank you again so much for your time and coming on to talk about thank this stuff. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, you guys can find me on YouTube, Rotting Jewels. Uh, Twitter is Dana Duda. Instagram is also Rotting Jewels. Um, and yeah, that's it. We're going to be getting into the Son of Sam. I'm still identifying some of the uh, other members of the process because, you know, we can't look at the whole thing until I ID everybody, but we're getting real close. And then we are going to do a very long form series about uh, L. Ron Hubbard's intelligence history and his ties specifically within Operation Gladio because it's just, Gladio's kind of fun, you know, and especially uh, thinking about L. Ron Hubbard because he's painted as such a buffoon and uh, he is, in my opinion, the most successful intelligence operative uh, known to current day history. So that's where we will be going. Lovely. Well, I look forward to it. And I just want you to know that I'm rooting for you. And I really Thanks. thank you for all you're doing. I know it takes a lot of time, a lot of digging. It has to be a labor of love, you know, to go through some of this stuff. So uh, yeah, keep going and uh, keep being yourself because it's awesome. And you're doing a lot of great work. So thank you so much, my lady. I appreciate thank you. Thank you. Bye. Y yep. Have a great night. You too. Thanks for having me. Of course. Bye-bye. All righty, y'all. Wow. We packed so much in and that was so freaking awesome. I feel like I had more questions. We could have kept going, but I would love to have Dana back on at some point because knowing that she's going to kind of be shifting gears into some of the other realms where these people are present and where they're linked to makes me excited to find out what other great information she's going to uncover because she's going to come across stuff. I mean, we can bet our bottom dollars on that one for sure. So as usual, I've got some updates for y'all. So I'm going to put some slides up on the screen. If we can get them on here. Hold on a second. But yeah, thank you all for hanging out. This was so wonderful. And it was really nice to actually get a chance to talk to Dana because I watch her streams and I'm like, oh my God, I want to sit down and have coffee with her. <laughs> I want to talk to her and I want to just pick her brain. And so this was just wonderful uh, to be able to collaborate a little bit and uh, get to know her better. So michelleshealinghome.com for all things Michelle. Um, all things healing home. You can find it all on the website now. Mario and I did a really big revamp of everything. There's also an online store now, which uh, is brand new and very excellent and awesome. So head to michelleshealinghome.com for any information that you'd like to find out. Right now up on the screen is my current menu. Uh, so you'll be able to find all of these items besides the tinctures. They'll, they're all up on the website. And if you're interested in the, in the tinctures, I'm going to be adding them to the store very soon. It's just literally a matter of me doing a photo shoot. So um, we've got hemp and honey soap. We have oat and honey soap. That are th These are my full moon offerings for the month. Honey soaps are some of my favorite soaps to make. They are some of the more nourishing soaps. Their um, honey is what's called um, a humicant. And a humicant is uh, something that will attract moisture and hold moisture into the skin. And honey is a natural humicant. So when you add it to soap, it just really ups the moisturizing properties, the exfoliation properties, but also the ability for the skin to retain the moisture that is lost, you know, just during the day or literally from washing your face, you know, or, or, or body, you can sometimes lose moisture that way. But the soap, when there's honey in it, brings it back in there. So those are really wonderful. Very happy with how they came out. Both are scented just divinely. So if you're interested in those, you can check that out. You can learn more about them on my website, but they're also here up on the screen. 
We have the hemp and honey. Um, the hemp is a uh, um, pure organic hemp seed oil, which I'll say is becoming my one of my favorite oils to use in soap because the lather that's created from these bars, specifically the hemp one, is out of sight. It's really great. So it's colored with uh, stevia leaf powder, um, and uh, it's it's just great. And the other color that comes from it is literally from the hemp oil because there's a really generous amount of hemp seed oil in that bar. Full Moon Offering Newsletter next issue comes out November 27th while the moon is full. So you can look for that. Thank you to all the patrons out there. You guys are freaking awesome. And I really appreciate all the support you guys give to uh, the channel, to me and to Mario. Uh, Chance, Sarah G, Liam, Amy, Miri and Hank, Jenny G, Erica, Moonlander, Spoons, Mary, Louie, Diane, Logan, Debbie, Natasha, Mary Beth, Nausicaa, Stephanie, Jennifer, Sharalai, Peter, Elise and James, Amy, Rachel, and Trisha. Thank you guys so, so, so much. For anyone who would like to become a patron, patreon.com slash the healing home is where you can do that. Um, patrons all receive my, um, the full moon offering newsletter, or at least the announcement for the, um, the actual offering, you get it a day before everybody else on the newsletter, which allows you to, um, you know, then get your uh, hands on some of the goodies before they are sold out because I do very small batches. That's just one of my things. Next week on The Healing Home, we have Sherry Rothwell of Delish Diet. I just was introduced to Sherry through Beth Martins. Beth Martins has worked with her as she's one, a nutritionist. Um, and Beth has had some really great results working with her over the years. And so Beth Martins just had her on her show for the first, maybe the first time, but the first time I was seeing her was just a few weeks ago. And as soon as I heard her speak, I was like, oh my God, I love this woman's thought process on health and healing and a relationship with food and how uh, that is a really big deal when it comes to our own healing journey. So Sherry and I are going to get into all of that and all the things that she does next week on November 7th here on The Healing Home at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Mario and I were both on Crow 777 radio recently, which is really exciting for both of us. And uh, up on the screen, you can see the thumbnails uh, for our episodes. Uh, mine came out uh, just about three weeks ago now or two and a half weeks ago. And Mario's episode just dropped on Sunday. So you guys can check out the uh, first hour free on uh, Crow 777 radio.com. Um, and you can also become a member to get the second hour. Um, um, and it's really exciting what's going on with all of that because we are able to just share our knowledge with more people. So thanks and shout out to Crow, Jason and Rose for all their support and being interested in the things that we're putting out there. Really grateful for the opportunity. Last Thursday, every Thursday, taking calls and hanging out. We are most likely going to come to you with another last Thursday this week. We're a little on the fence, but Pro we're probably be about 85% going to be there <laughs> on last Thursday. So, uh, and then if you guys liked what we talked about tonight, uh, and you haven't checked it out, Mario and I did a summer of love series on last Thursday, this summer. And we talked a lot about a lot of the things that we just talked about tonight. Um, and so we went into all sorts of things. You can find that under my live tab on my YouTube channel if you want to recap any of that kind of stuff and hear our thoughts about the 60s, the hippie movement, the culture, the process, you name it. We, we tried to cover it. Um, and so you can check that out um, in the archives there on the Healing Home YouTube channel. Symbolicstudies.com for all things Mario. Uh, his website is now also very streamlined, so you can schedule tarot readings and study sessions with him. You can purchase his prints. You can purchase um, his uh, symbolic uh, elemental study packet. You can also, uh, you know, inquire about design work because he also uh, he's been a graphic designer for over 20 years. So he has actually uh, had the privilege to work with a lot of people that follow his work, which has been really fun for him because he is working with people who are on sort of the same wavelength, which is really nice to be able to do that with and to, um, you know, people who have just noticed his videos over the years and his graphic skill and are coming to him for logos 
business cards, you know, you name it, uh, websites and all those things. So Mario can do things like that. So you can go to his website to inquire with that. And with all of that said, all the updates out of the way, that is our Halloween episode. I hope you guys are having a wonderful holiday, however you choose to celebrate or not celebrate. Um, you know, this is just a great time to reconnect with your ancestors, with people who have passed over, um, with pets who have passed over. You know, the veil is very thin right now. So they... Um, they're, they can come through more easily. So if there's messages or blessings or just thoughts that you'd like to share with some of your ancestors, you know, now is the time to do it. Light a candle, take some time, write an intention. Another practice that I like to do specifically on like the Day of the Dead and All Saints Day um, that you people may have heard of. But, you know, if you have a, uh, a relative that had a a special food that they really liked or a special drink they really liked, you know, something that's fun is to leave that food or drink out for them as an offering. Um, and this is a really great time to do that. And I really like the intention and the symbolism behind doing things like that, because even though they can't physically enjoy maybe the item that you're putting out there, just the thought of you doing that for them, I think it, it, it brings them closer to you and it kind of like opens up a door or a gateway for you to have an experience with them or just acknowledge them and to appreciate something that they really loved, you know? Um, so that's something that you could think of doing um, during these times right now. Um, it's something that I like to do and I always feel like there's a strong resonance when you do something like that, um, specifically just a heart connection with that person or pet that has passed over. So until next time. Oh, and I see Thunder Chicken. You're here. Hey, I charged up our um, our uh, pens finally. So I'm going to be able to try your uh, your oil tonight in the cartridge. I'm really excited, actually, after we have dinner. <laughs> We're going to have a whole sesh, <laughs> a Lee Thunder Chicken sesh. So anyway, thanks again for that. Um, and yeah, you guys take care out there. And we'll see you next week with Sherry Rothwell of Delish Dish. All right, y'all. We'll see you soon. Later.